All right. Jag tror att vi är här allihopa. Och jag hoppas att ni kan höra mig. Det ser ut som så i alla fall från mitt håll. Så har ni några problem så får ni gärna lägga en kommentar i kommentarsfältet. Vid min förra föreläsning så blev det ju lite tokigt alltihopa med en massa strul. Men dagens föreläsning är på engelska så jag byter språk. All right, hello everyone. We're doing an experiment today and that is doing a lecture with a Swedish photographer for a Swedish photography company, but we're doing it in English. And the reason for this is because we're talking about the Jubilee expedition. It's a project that spans over countries across borders, has participants from all over the world. And I've also had quite a lot of requests from you people out there that this presentation should be in English. And that's what we're doing. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really grateful to Cyberphoto for their support for the Jubilee expedition, for their support as me as a photographer. And I'm really happy that I'm getting an opportunity for a second conversation uh, here live on so Cyberphoto's YouTube channel. And I think that's, uh, yeah, it's going to be really fun. So we're going to jump straight into it. And hopefully we will not have any technical mishaps today. But when I'm involved, who knows? So we are going to jump straight into this presentation. And first we are just going to do if we can get this presentation to change page. There we go. Just a quick intro uh, to who I am. My name is Jonas Parel, as I said. I work normally full time teaching photography through Terra Photography Expeditions. Uh, I've done that for about seven years now. And in that time, I have been working full time delivering photography workshops and also doing my own photography projects in the background. I've done uh, probably over 100 workshops and well over 500 participants in my workshops over these years. I'm a certified international mountain leader, which means I am qualified to guide in mountains uh, for trekking tours and such. Uh, but in, uh, in my background for all my sins, I'm also a lawyer, uh, even though I haven't worked as a lawyer for many, many years. Here you can see some of the links. And if you want to find me on social media, it's uh, Jonas Paurel on most of the social medias. Just don't try Facebook because I do my best to stay away from that these days. All right. Um, this, as I said, is a second of uh, my lectures for Cyberphoto. And uh, the first one was about conservation photography for nature photographers. That was a lecture in Swedish. The second one, the Jubilee Expedition, is now Uh, in English. And the two following ones might be in Swedish, might be in English. We'll see what the response is. Uh, but that is to be decided. Also, the date is to be decided. But all we know is that in January, we're doing one lecture on expedition photography. And then in February, we're doing a second one about creating a printing and a photography exhibition. And this is about the up and coming uh, exhibition at Fairfabriken in Stockholm. And that is a photo exhibition at around a thousand square meters. It's a really, really big one. And uh, I'm collaborating with Epson on that one. So it's going to be really fun and interesting and see what we can learn and how we can explore everything from the creative choices to printing techniques. Uh, but we're going to start now with a little tiny video here. Uh, and I hope we will have audio on this one because there were some uncertainties on that before. But it, it last time we tested it, it did work. So we'll see if it actually works now. I'm now starting my third night here in this tent, in this camp. Uh, we've been snowed in for three days and uh, I've spent that time reading, uh, recording a podcast, well, several podcasts actually, and relaxing. And um, yeah, it's fun to be in the Arctic. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, it could be fun. Uh, it is fun. Ah, let's just say it's an experience, okay? Because it's hell of a not. It's not fun. I'm like lying here in a sleeping bag inside a vapor barrier liner, which is basically a big plastic bag. Outside this plastic bag is a sleeping bag rated for minus 29 Celsius comfort temperature, I should add. Uh, inside this i also have two bottles two naldium bottles with boiled water to keep me extra toasty and extra hot uh, i'm wearing woolen underwear fleece pants uh, <laughs> a woolen shirt a fleece shirt vest and a down parka <laughs> and i'm still freezing yeah welcome to the arctic guys oh my god 
I've cleaned my entrance. I have emptied my magic bottle. It's time to head back to the tent. And uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna have to build some more walls for tonight, some higher walls. Have a look at this. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. That was, I think, I'm not sure, but I think it was day three or day four or something like that on the Jubilee expedition. And as you can see, we were completely snowed in, caught in a snowstorm, unable to move, days ticking away and unable to follow the route we had set because of this snowstorm. Uh, today, we are going to have a good time, I think, talking about expeditions and history about the climate crisis, about various topics around all this, why this expedition took place, what it actually was all about, uh, who participated, who helped out, and uh, how was it actually to be there? How was it to enjoy this expedition? And uh, after that, we're also going to have a conversation about uh, the exhibition coming of this and all the other outputs. Uh, so the sections of this expedition we can say is the history, signifying with this map, which we're going to look in quite a lot of detail later. We're going to talk about the adventure itself, the incredible experience the six of us had out in Arctic, out in the snow for almost a month. And uh, we're going to talk towards the end of this presentation about the artworks, uh, the artworks that I created as a photographer, as a landscape photographer, nature, nature photographer out on this expedition, which was perhaps the most challenging expedition of my life and the harshest conditions I've ever worked in in my life and the most difficult conditions to create in. Uh, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. That's, I guess, the summary of the whole thing. Uh, but we're going to start from the beginning. We're going to start with why this happened, why this expedition came about to be. And for me, it all grounds down in my passion for the Arctic. For so many years, I have loved to visit the Arctic landscapes in the world. Over and over and over again, I've done so. And over those years that I visited those landscapes, I've seen a change in those landscapes. There is stranger snow conditions. There's more ice, less snow. There is uh, less glaciers. It's warmer. The winter is shorter. And as a landscape photographer with a passion for those environments, it's sad. It's sad to see it. This shot here from up in uh, northern Sweden, you know, you don't want to end up there in March and it's raining, but that's a reality now. That can very well happen. Whereas just 20 years ago, that would never have happened. The climate crisis is real. The global warming is real and it's happening all around us. And um, as such, I think it's, uh, it's important to recognize that and to do what Whatever one can to do it. In my case, I think it's advocacy. Those are the things that I can do. So this is just some images from around the world. Uh, the last one here is from Greenland. And this is Greenland in the end of, well, middle of 2019, autumn 2019, just before COVID hit. And uh, here we have the front page of one of the Swedish newspaper uh, when uh, Denmark had just closed the border to Sweden, 14th of March, 20. 22 no sorry 2020 Denmark closed the border and as Denmark closed that border um, it became impossible for me to do my work to do my job to make a living up until this point I have done maybe up to 14 expeditions a year photography expeditions around the world everywhere from Himalaya to the Amazonas to Greenland to the Alps to Arctic Norway and Sweden and whatnot and all of a sudden it's over uh, the business that I had worked on for years to grow and had grown well, been able to make a living on it sustainably. And all of a sudden, because of COVID, you know, it's over, game over. Uh, of course, I didn't have it as bad as many other people did that lost uh, family members in this period, but 
as a business owner, you know, it's not fun when that happens, but I saw it as an opportunity. And one day I was reading this book, which is a Swedish text. There exists also a translation of uh, this text in English. And if anyone wants to to find out about this and read more about this, send me a message and I'll get you the link because uh, it's really fun reading. But this is basically a book or a short text about the Swedish polar expedition, as it was called then, 1872 to 1873, uh, led by Adolf Erik Nordenskjöld, which in my view is the most amazing polar explorer that Sweden has ever produced. He uh, is perhaps most famous for the, 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 the Northeast Passage, where he sailed the ship Vega and uh, were the first one to open up that, uh, that uh, waterway to, to the east uh, from Europe, which has before then believe, believed to be impossible. He also proved that it was not perhaps practical to do it either, but at least he proved that it was possible. And as a polar explorer, he was uh, a really, really cool person. He was a, a professor. Uh, he teached in geology and uh, mineralogy at the Technical Institute, as it was called then, in Stockholm. He was a uh, part of the, the Royal uh, Science Academy here in Sweden. And he undertook numerous expeditions to Svalbard, to Greenland, across all of the Arctic. And uh, I'd say that he was the most active polar explorer we probably ever had in Sweden and did a lot and a lot of it very very exciting in my view i rate him up there with uh, the name of like uh, roald uh, almondson fritjof nansen robert perry shackleton for me uh, he is one of those and he achieved so much incredible things and uh, i think it's really cool to read his history uh, because his history has kind of become a little bit forgotten at least here in sweden it is um, but uh, what he wanted to do, at least with this expedition that he set off on, uh, and I should perhaps mention right now that it's exactly 150 years ago since he did that, hence the name the Jubilee Expedition, because obviously we set out to try to recreate part of his historical expedition. But what he set out to do was to be the first to reach the North Pole. Uh, I often call that expedition, I'm going to see if I can get my full face instead for a while, I call that expedition the expedition where everything went wrong. You know, He set off from Sweden on two boats, or perhaps even three boats, uh, made it up to Svalbard. His idea was to overwinter on the uh, Seven Islands, which is this group, uh, if you can see my mouse here, at the very top here on the map. And from there, he was supposed to set off with initially uh, sled dogs and go all the way to the North Pole and be the first person to ever reach the North Pole. That was the plan. Well, it turns out that the sled dogs he wanted to buy from Greenland, they had all had some kind of dog plague, so they were all dead or infected, so he couldn't get sled dogs. Instead, he ended up uh, getting reindeers, uh, and he also included a couple of representatives of the Sami people uh, on the expedition itself to take care of the reindeers and also to share their incredible wealth that they had at that time of traveling through the Arctic landscapes. And um, as they set off up, first they were... They were locked in ice in this region down here uh, for a couple of months before they could continue all the way. But they did never even made it up to these seven islands up here. Instead, they were forced to overwinter down here in this area, which is called Mosul Bay. And uh, before uh, he could be dropped and the ships could return to Sweden, uh, there was a big snowstorm and all the ships were actually frozen in and they were unable to leave. And um, I can show you an image of that right here. And with that, uh, instead of only being, I think, 21 people, here we go, the image, instead of being only 21 people overwintering, um, all right, I just got a message that the mouse is not visible. That's really good to know because I thought I could see it here on the screen. Uh, here you have the ships frozen in and uh, impossible for them to actually return back to Sweden. So instead of them being 21 people overwintering here in their base camp, uh, before their uh, pursuit of the North Pole. They became, in the end, uh, I think 124, because also they, they received a group of uh, frozen Norwegian sailors uh, that uh, had to overwinter to save their lives. So there was a lot of scurvy, a lot of uh, malnutrition, a lot of death. Um, 39 of the 40 rangers they had brought with them escaped. They only had one token reindeer left in the end. They named him Krister. Uh, for some reason. 
And uh, then they set off on their expedition. They lost people during this uh, this attempt. They first reached up to seven islands where they initially had thought that they would overwinter. And from there, they realized there's no chance that they can reach the North Pole this year. So instead of giving up, they decided to take this red route. I'm going to see if you can see my mouse now. I'm going to put on this laser pointer. So they were, uh, instead of uh, starting off from this island here and going north, uh, they were overwintering here in Mossel Bay. And then they followed this route. So they, they went all the way to Seven Island in the pursuit of the North Pole. From here they made the decision it's impossible. But instead of giving up and going home, they decided to be the first people to explore the inland of North Eastland. It's a huge island here. At that point no one was known at least to have ever visited that. So Nordenskjöld was very curious about uh, the geology, marine biology, uh, the climate, the weather uh, and all these things. So they set off on a 550 kilometer expedition uh, pulled by, by hand, by men. They, they didn't have any fancy harnesses like we do today. They, they were literally pushing these, uh, these pulks that were made to actually be drawn by reindeers and they were pushing them by hand. It took them over two months to complete this expedition of 550 kilometers. And during this time, they did a lot of scientific research and they came back to Sweden a year later, perhaps with a failed expedition, but they had advanced the knowledge uh, of the Arctic. They had done a ton of interesting science and they actually came back as heroes. But if we are to have a little look at where in the world we're actually at. Uh, so here is obviously our world and you can see the North Pole up here and this here. This is Svalbard. And this down here is Sweden where Nordenskjöld set off. So he went as far north as you can in the world basically uh, without actually reaching the North Pole. And uh, here we go. If you look at Svalbard itself, you can see here that it's situated more, more or less in the middle of the North Pole and Tromsø, which is the northernmost populated city uh, before you, you reach the North Pole. So it's, uh, yeah, it's far away. It's a, it's a very cold and uh, very, um, very Arctic environment. But let's have a look. So I started researching this entire expedition because, you know, at this point I still haven't, I don't have any idea that I actually want to join them, that I want to try to recreate this. I'm just sitting there in my sofa. COVID has just broken out, got nothing to do. And I'm just enjoying reading about this polar adventure. And then I realize uh, through a footnote or something like that, that there is an image archive that there was apparently a photographer called Alec Axel Enval. I believe he was also the, the doctor of the team that had uh, been with wet plate photography done a lot of uh, photos from the expedition. And obviously I started digging to see where I could find them. And I found an online archive of them. And I, I got even more excited and interesting in this incredible endeavor this incredible experience and and sacrifice to to try to discover something to try to to experience something new and to learn something new about our world uh, these texts and these Im images really took me back to the age of exploration uh, well although the arctic age of exploration if if one is going to be strict about historical terms and this image here exactly by the way is including Christer the reindeer and uh, here we have them, the team sitting outside the house they built for overwintering in, um, in, in Mossel Bay in Svalbard. And I just started dreaming more and more. And I guess you could say I got a little bit obsessed uh, with this project. But it was not until I saw this image, uh, which is an image that depicts uh, the, uh, the spread of sea ice. Uh, in the Arctic and uh, where it used to be in 1970. So this basically shows where the sea ice would have been in winter time, I should add. And uh, you can see how it crept back for the 80s, for the 90s, for the 2000s. And then you look at where Svalbard is situated and more importantly where North Eastland is situated in relation to the receding Arctic ice. And all of a sudden it becomes, in my view, a very interesting task to see if this area right here, north of Svalbard, this must be one of the regions on the planet, I thought, where we would be able to see 
the most of climate change, the rapidly melting ice. We would really be able to witness firsthand what is happening. But what, what does it mean? What, does the, what is the point of this Arctic ice? Do we need to preserve it? I started researching. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not a scientist of any type. But uh, I became very interested in the topic. And uh, I started just trying to get myself back. Here we go. You can see him in the corner again, I think. Uh, I started realizing that the Arctic actually works as, you could call it the air conditioner of the planet. Uh, and the Antarctic, of course, with the same function. But the Arctic is just a floating ice mass. Basically, all the streams in the world are uh, more or less one way or another ending up there. And they are being cooled down there before the water is again redistributed all over the world. That, I thought, was um, uh, a pretty cool function. And then I realized that the ice sheet and the snow on the land, it functions as a big reflector. It sends back much of the sun's energy out into space. But what happens then when the ice disappears? Well, it is that all that sun, the energy from the sun, instead of being refle reflected back into the world, it's being absorbed by the exposed land and the exposed sea. So then I started realizing that when the Arctic melts, we're going to have a rapidly increasing rate of global warming. The climate crisis is going to escalate. So when is it going to melt? What is the prediction? So if we go back to this little map, we can see that already in 20 years, it's almost gone. In 50 years, it's literally gone. How is that going to affect the planet? Well, I can't tell you. I'm not a scientist. But thankfully, I found out a way to work with scientists that can tell you. And that is what this is all about. It's about building a platform for other people that actually know what they're talking about. Not just me, a happy photographer, but actual people that know this stuff so that people can listen to them. So I realized then that I was sitting on a good idea. But I needed to crystallize it. I needed to answer the most important question. If I'm going to try to recreate this incredible route done by Professor Nordenkult, how on earth am I going to get that funded? My initial budget was that I would have to have at least 300 to 400,000 euros to be able to do that. And so I started thinking around keywords. I realized I needed to have real impact. This needed to be about advocacy, climate change advocacy. It needed to be a big adventure, something, something that really would make people dream. But I realized that it cannot be about me. It has to be about real scientists, people that actually matter more than I as a photographer do. And I'm not saying that I don't matter, but I'm saying in the grand scheme of things about advocating and communicating climate change, I think there are people that matter more than I do. And uh, <clears throat> I realized that it had to be about people, about connecting with people. Because I had this thing, like I can still remember the, when the first episode of Survivor, or Robinson as we call it in Swedish, aired on TV many, many years ago. And I still remember the names of the characters on that silly TV show. Why do I remember that? I remember it because I connected with those people through the through the through the filming, through the, the, the series. And I realized that this has to be about people, people who are tired, angry, sad, happy, vulnerable. And how do you how do you share this? I realized that we have to have a fantastic story. And that is where our dear Professor Nordenkull come in. The Jubilee expedition, 150 years later, trying to recreate. I can tell you now it's impossible. Well, at least for us. And um, trying to merge together art uh, and science. We needed to achieve a really wide distribution so that people actually would be able to listen to what we're saying, listen to what the scientists are actually saying. We needed to achieve this through using many different platforms and many different mediums. We're going to publish a book from this expedition, a photo book, like a journal uh, of the experience. We are 
going to produce, oh, well, it's already done actually, it's a podcast series that is going to share the real stories from inside the tent in Svalbard. We are going to do a photography exhibition at Fajfabriken in Stockholm, which is uh, one of the premier mixed art spaces in Sweden, and it is a mega show, a very big photography exhibition, definitely bigger than anything I have ever dreamed of, and uh, something that is really exciting. And then we're going to take all this and put it together in a film, the documentary film being released in autumn 2023. And when I realized that when I had all these keywords, all these ideas and concepts, all these different ways of reaching people and distributing this, I realized that I had something that I actually could sell, something that could get the sponsors in, because I could not afford to produce this myself without external financing. So if we try to kind of summarize all this, I would say this is climate crisis advocacy shared through the lens of adventure. The real goals of this project is to tell the story of the warming polar region, but in a way that people will listen. It is about giving climate scientists a platform from which to speak to the world, a platform from which they can actually say something that matter and we will all listen. It's about telling the story of the adventurous human spirit. 550 kilometers, what, what Nordenskjöld did. Our route in the end, or at least our plan, was to do 330 kilometers. And I will explain later why that is. But to really share and celebrate our adventure. That we did it. That we did it because perhaps we were crazy enough. Perhaps we were happy enough. Perhaps we were sad enough about the environment. Perhaps we cared enough. I don't know. But that's the story. That's the goal. And we also wanted to see if we could recreate some of the climate science that uh, Nordenskjöld had done back then with the results now. But again, that was something that was very difficult to do, but I'll show you later. It's impossible for me to give this presentation without giving credit where credit is due. Our main sponsor, Carnegie Investment Bank, and our incredible, incredible group of technical partners, sponsors and creative partners. Without all these companies, this project would never have been possible. And I cannot express enough my gratitude to all of the companies that were part of sponsoring what we did. This expedition is so much about the team. First of all, we have us, the six of us that were out in Svalbard on the ice. And uh, this little six group of six were made up by the leaders, myself and Christy Jonsson. Christy Jonsson is a uh, mountain guide living down in the Chamonix area. We had our science team, uh, Dr. Susanna Hancock, a multidisciplinary climate researcher, Eric Hus, a glaciologist, Marcus Fjellström, an archaeologist helping us with the connection to Nordenhult, and of course Ingeborg Pei, another glaciologist from Norway. A fantastic team of people that volunteered their time their efforts and their energy to make this product a reality. Unfortunately, in the end, only two of them could join us on the actual expedition due to basically budget constraints. And that was uh, Dr. Susanna Hagencock and Eric Hus. We had the film team, Aoi Rabelista Nyhoff, our film director, Martin Olson, our DOP, and myself as the producer. And we had an amazing expedition support team led by Minu Helgren, uh, a wilderness guide. And uh, we had Jakob Nortoft, our legal counsel, that made sure that we were staying safe and legal in everything we were doing. Emma Jonsson and Sanna Nilsson, another two wilderness guys that were invaluable in helping out, finding out specifics about parts of the routes and challenging ad uh, administration and challenging uh, logistics to get all the gear there and everything. I could not have done this alone and I could not have done this without them. We had my wife, Veronica. Uh, who was always there at the end of a phone line and always supporting and always helping out in the background. And we had Matilda Bengtsson and Elin Jalemark, our two fantastic marketing and event interns that helped out with our communication strategy and our communication during the actual expedition. Now that we have spoken about the team and we've spoken about the why and the what perhaps, let's, well, now we're going to look at the what in detail. This here was the route taken by Nordenskjöld. Um, let me see here. There we go. Why can't we do that route today? Well, problem one. 
Hinloop and Strait. This uh, mass of water that separates North Eastland from the rest of Svalbard. Just go back 20 years and that would have been more or less frozen in winter time. Not really possible to cross it now for the majority of, uh, of the winter now. Because uh, it fills up with the drift ice and then that drift ice clears out and it fills up again with drift ice. But the problem with drift ice is that it can be very dangerous to move on. And it's definitely not something that you can uh, put together a team of uh, like like us, uh, a mix between perhaps guides, scientists and uh, filmmakers. This is uh, to complete the crossing with these climate conditions we have now. That would be the real, real expedition where your life is at risk and without hesitation. So that was our first problem. Our second problem was that the northern side of North Eastland doesn't really freeze reliably in winter time. And this is also one of the more polar bear dense places in the world, which would have meant uh, a significant time in, um, in a very, very hostile environment. We still had that, but at least it was less of a risk. And in the end, the Wallenberg Fjord, again, doesn't freeze anymore due to global warming. So we had all these reasons why it would be impossible to recreate Nordenskjöld's original route. And when I started realizing that, when I started looking at that, I initially became quite, quite sad. And I'm like, oh my God, the expedition is impossible. Well, we have to fail on purpose. That came out in a discussion between plenty of the different partners. And that was the most empowering thing in this entire project phase. It took me two years uh, alone and together with the team to build this expedition. But when we realized that we have to fail on purpose, when we realized that the route done by Nordenskjöld for us would be impossible, and we gave ourselves the opportunity to say, we can't follow it exactly, that's impossible for us. But we're allowed to fail, and we're failing because of climate change, because of the climate crisis. All of a sudden, the whole project kind of came together and we set out to define our new route. So what we decided to do was that since we couldn't cross the Hinlopen Strait, we were going to start from the very same start point as Nordenskjöld did, follow his route north uh, to the very northern part of uh, Spitsbergen and then turn south and basically march together all the way back to Longyearbyen where we would be able to fly home. I like to, in my mind, think of it as a silent march of protest, but uh, perhaps that's not the most popular way to label it. But that's what it felt like to me, at least in many instances. But what's interesting about this route is that uh, even that, due to global warming, it turned out was not possible. So this was the original start that we were planning. I'm going to see if we can get the mouse pointer visible again on the screen. I believe it is. Uh, so we were starting here, the left side of the gray here. And from there, we were going to continue north, take the, 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 the route around, down south, a little bit north and down south. And that for us was going to be the basically coastal part of the expedition. Um, and the most dangerous part of the expedition, because here is really Polar Bear Central. And uh, this would have been uh, nightly watches every night, uh, bear fence up every night. But we were not able to do that. Uh, as we were moving in, we had forecast of a huge uh, snowstorm campaign. And we also realized that the entire expedition team, including myself, were exhausted. I had been spent, I spent two years full time, but the last three months before expedition, I didn't have a single break. I just worked to get this all to happen. And as we arrived there, we all realized that we're going to need 24 to 48 hours just staying put before we move down into polar bear terrain because the polar bears they really stay by the coastline because it's by the coastline where they can find the, the seals which is their primary food so we decided to stay higher up on the glacier on Tobrien before we move down into the coastline which turned out to be a very good decision because as soon as we got there we had some really really delicious sleep important sleep and then we moved down here we go. We moved down to the area uh, in Mossel Bay where Nordenskjöld overwintered uh, 150 years ago. And then from there we moved back up. And I'm just going to show you this on the map, the, the route in a bit faster speed now, now that I've explained the first big trouble we had here. But basically 
what happened was that as soon as we got back up here after having visited this area, we had had a weather forecast via satellite, via Garmin, saying that basically we're going to be snowed in for at least potentially a week. And you do not want to be here on the coastline in a complete whiteout, in a snowstorm, in tents, surrounded by polar bears, because you have no visibility. There's no, you can't even keep guard. If you can't see more than a couple of meters, anytime, any point, you could have a huge potential security risk in the expedition. And for us, it was not worth it. So we made our way down, slept one night down here uh, at the lagoon, and then up visited the Nordenschulz uh, overwinter spot. And I'll show you some images from that in a bit. And then we heard back up. And then this point up here again, our starting point, same camp. That's where we were basically snowed in for a couple of days later when the snow hit. After that, we moved up and we were supposed to, we were supposed to have come this way, but instead we had a much steeper climb, which was really challenging, really, really challenging. And uh, then we moved up at what we consider, basically, you can see here, this is the ridge line. This is the basically the highest point here uh, of the entire island, which means that you're walking on top of everything. I'm going to show you some images where you're going to see this looks like an ice desert. There's no horizon. There's just ice and sky. And then we were supposed to follow this ridge line, which with this part we were able to follow, make our way down through the Trinity Glacier here, down to Veteran and another glacier. And... In this section four, we were supposed to be in completely different terrain, surrounded by mountains on both sides for a couple of days as we move up. And then again, we were supposed to travel up here again on the top of a glacier through again some kind of ice desert. But we were actually forced here to turn away and move down to the sea for a boat pickup. And I'm going to get into the details about why that happened a little bit later. But we were supposed to have traveled this way. And then we were supposed to have traveled this way through Sassendalen and then through, um, uh, oh, no, I don't remember the name of this, Adventalen, that's the name of it. Uh, and then through this valley, get ourselves back to Longyearbyen. But instead, we came this route via boat. Uh, but I think it's much more fun to describe this with some images than to discuss it uh, with maps in front of us. But at least now we have a, a good overview of what we actually did. So this is how it started, the 2nd of May 2022. So that's what, almost half a year ago, or pretty precisely half a year ago. Uh, all of us loaded up, seven snowmobiles, seven drivers, six of us, uh, lots of fuel, lots of food. Everyone had approximately 60 kilos of equipment at the start. Uh, we also dropped some, uh, some food along the way, depot boxes, because we knew that we would take the same route back as we did on the way in. So that was a way for us to save some of the weight, but we still had massive amounts of gear, given that we were always carrying the film, filmmaking gear, photography gear, safety gear, bear fences, rifles, ammunition, survival gear, food, fuel, you name it. So 60 kilos per person is not a picnic when it's about of a month long expedition. And this is what it looked like. This here is uh, one of our first days, one of the first five days, I should say. We've just been down to visit uh, Poolhem, which is where Nordenskjöld overwintered. And uh, these are the landscapes that we were greeted with on our first few days. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, but also hostile. Snow flying in the air, wind coming and going, and never knowing down here on the coast if there are polar bears lurking. As we were moving, we stopped constantly. Krister, our, uh, our mountain guide, he was always in the front and I was in the back for 99% of the time. Uh, and both of us with binoculars and rifles, making sure that there were nothing else around that could harm us, basically. And that was a stressful thing. This constant watch, constantly looking over the shoulder to see if there were polar bears or any other risk, because we were also moving on glaciers, right? Glacial cracks was something that took a huge toll on me as a person, at least. And here we are snowed in. Here you can see that we are just before we have set up our, our little walls. I showed you a little clip. Uh, that's from the very same camp as this one, but a few, one or two days later. This is when we've just made it back up to, to uh, after visiting Polham and um, we, uh, before we've set up, the, before the snowstorm hit, basically. But uh, here we are. Constructing, constructing. You become a master snowmason when you go on expedition in the Arctic because you build so many snow walls. Almost every day we had to put up something like this. It takes a lot of energy to build these walls, but this is necessary for, um, for your survival. 
Uh, one day, the wind actually turned and broke one of the tents. Uh, we were able to repair it, thankfully. Otherwise, it would have been cramped in all the other tents. But uh, the wind there is really dangerous. But here we are, Poolham. So this little thing here, this little hut, this is basically the reconstructed version of uh, the original Poolham, the one built by Nordenskjöld. Of course, it doesn't stay, it's not there anymore. Uh, it's arctic conditions up there. This house since long is long gone, rotted or blown or whatever away. It is, the only thing rest, re left from that is the foundation. And it's in this very same spot that they built this other little, little hut that we're sitting in front of. And we decided to do a little simple recreation of that photo just because we were so emotional being there. Uh, for me, that is exactly two years since I started planning this expedition. And for all the others in the team, it's about half a year since they started being part of the team building up uh, for this expedition. Here's a little wonky, there's not a single straight angle in this house, wonky shot uh, of this little hut from the inside. As I said, it's obviously not the same hut as Nordenskjöld was at. Here we have outside uh, Dr. Susanna Hancock uh, taking observations. Observations is key to science, I learned, and she's writing everything down in her diary. And here, just sharing some of the, the images of conditions we walk through. Here is a good visibility, here not so much. This is uh, Martin Olson, our director of photography. He is perhaps, what, 70 to 100 meters from us, and we can barely see him anymore. This kind of pea soup, uh, this kind of fog, is incredibly hard to navigate through. Um, you walk five meters and you lost your, your compass bearing. Uh, you're constantly navigating through this, and it's so challenging. You can see here, I'm walking in the back, and I can hardly see Krister in the front. This is, uh, this is what we signed up for. But you can imagine also as a photographer, this was frustrating because I couldn't do any photography almost on days like this because there's nothing to shoot. Well, unless you're very minimalist and like white. Um, and landscapes like this, uh, this was one of my favorite moments of the whole expedition. We had these incredible minimalist kind of landscapes in the distance and I as a person was just humming with energy. I had such an amazing time photographing these landscapes. Uh, but then thankfully the sun returned and you can see the joy. This is uh, Eric Kuss, I believe, and Awi Rabalista. Uh, energized, really energized. A few minutes after this, uh, Awi was skiing in a t-shirt. It was incredible weather in the arctic the sun and the warmth returned and we were now down in uh, on veteran and the glacier these kind of sunny days were so important for us as a team we had gone through a week of not seeing anything of having the coldest temperature of minus 28 and this is measured because we had a thermometer we had minus 28 degrees celsius and after that, you need sunshine, you need energy, we needed batteries. And here you can see that we have the full solar rig out. We're charging all the power banks. And Aoi standing there is also charging his, himself, just trying to absorb as much sun as possible because we were, by this point, we were exhausted. Erik here, airing out his sleeping bag. Sleeping bags tend to get quite wet after a couple of days of sleeping with condensation building up from yourself. And... Um, here, time for conversations. Um, not entirely sure who that is. It's Krister and someone else. Just standing, staring out over the landscape, having a nice conversation. These moments were precious because we were battling, you know. Every day, same thing, up in the morning. Took two hours to boil water, eat breakfast and put down the tent, pack the polk and off we go. Then we're moving for, you know, seven to eight hours. And then we have to up with the tent, unpack everything, get warm, melt water, and melting water for dinner is a two hour, three hour ordeal every day. It takes time to melt water because the only thing you have is snow. So you're melting everything with, uh, with petrol stoves. And this takes so much time and having moments like this where you can just stand, have a conversation. We needed that because we were all ex exhausted uh, at this point. I think we are losing, sorry. It looks like we're losing the quality a little bit. Hopefully that's not a problem. Um, no, we seem to be full quality again, at least according to what I can see when I'm supervising this from this side. Um, 
And these were also moments of rest, relaxation. Here, Eric is probably messaging his wife on the uh, Garmin uh, satellite messenger, uh, getting a moment to reconnect with the world outside. Because when you're there for a month on the Arctic, isolated, you're you're shut off from everything. And being able to connect, uh, message with your loved ones is so important. But also, of course, lots of coffee and lots of chocolate. Here, Eric is sitting with his uh, Prima stove, uh, probably melting water and eating too much chocolate. Uh, Susanna doing research also on these sunny, beautiful days. She was doing a climate project together with NASA, where she was uh, monitoring clouds. And uh, Aoi, our film director, filming, photographing, being happy. Martin taking care of his teeth, beautiful white, as I can see from here. Like these are the moments that we needed because we were we were so tired. And we also needed these moments to take care of our feet. Here's Susanna in the tent. You can see that she's tired. Uh, by this point, you know, we're 10, 12 or 15 days in. I'm not even sure anymore. And you can, our feet were falling apart. You know, every day we needed to do feet maintenance. But when it's minus 10 or minus 15 Celsius in the tent, you don't want to be barefoot. So having these few days of sunshine were they were so important. All right, I was just told that the audio didn't come through uh, in that one very well, and that might, I'm sh not sure why that was, but let's, ah, come on. I can't seem to play it again either. Somehow we're already on day 18. It's hard for myself. Ah, come on. It's hard for myself to fathom. Really hard. It is a incredible day. Cold, I reckon, well below minus 10. And uh, light breeze. And other than that, blue skies and sunshine. As you can see, I'm pretty heavily clad, even though we got these amazing conditions. I got this thing on my nose that is to protect it, not against the sun, but against the wind. We've already had quite a few noses without skin on this trip. And so far, I've been fortunate enough to keep my skin on my nose. And I intend to do so. All the extremities exposed to the wind will easily get frostbite. And that's something should be avoided at all cost. Got a slight uphill today. As you can see, I'm pulling my way too heavy book and I'm heading up towards the Thribria Passet or the three glacial pass here on Spitsbergen, Svalbard. All right, I hope you heard that a little bit better. And I'm going to get my image back in there. And um, yeah, like that, it continued. Uh, more snow walls and uh, then more snow walls. And here, unfortunately, I got some really bad news or the team got some really bad news from Longyearbyen. Let's have a look at that. Another happy day pulling the book. 
If I'm not mistaken, we're on day 22 or day 23 now. We uh, recently found out that we're unable to return to Longyearbyen by the way of skis. The warm front we've had over us now for almost a week has completely melted the snow in Advent Dalen and uh, Sassendalen, which means our expedition is soon over. We're still going to be out the same amount of days, going to dedicate more time to research, science, photography, podcasting, just enjoying being in the Arctic. And uh, then we're going to have a boat pickup that is going to take us the final stretch back to Longyearbyen. All in all, a good solution, but also a little bit disappointing. We always knew that this was a, a risk, not at all a certainty, but a risk go back 10 years, 20 years, it would not have been a risk. It would have been no problem to come in on the snow in late May. But uh, yeah, the Arctic is melting, the weather is changing. And with that, so is the opportunities to ski. All right. So um, there we were. Just got news from Longyearbyen that the two final valleys um, were basically bare no snow whatsoever left we didn't know it at the time but this was uh, the warmest may month ever recorded in history in svalbard and later also the warmest june um and we got beautiful days because of this warm weather it got warmer it was pleasant we were able to be out in the sun and explore uh eric here measuring the the depth of one of the glaciers en route uh the team moving through the most incredibly beautiful landscapes on planet Earth, perhaps. Uh, for me, I've never seen anything as beautiful as Svalbard. Uh, well, I can't say that. Arctic region in general is my favorite place on Earth, and there are places in Sweden that are just as beautiful as this, but definitely not as remote. And here, you can see me, I got a chance to record sounds. Uh, I was working here with uh, a technique from Audio Technica to record sounds of the glacier, something that was going to be incorporated into the um, uh, the exhibition at Pfeifferbrücken. What happened after this, however, was that the audio recorder, not the microphones, they worked great, but the audio recorder died. Uh, it fried because of condensation. Minus 28 and plus 10 and swinging back and forth was too much for the equipment. We had, uh, I had say probably 10 items or something of electronics that died during this expedition. Everything just froze to death because it was just too brutally cold. And then we set out we changed our route, as I showed you earlier on the map, and we headed down. And as you can see now, we are walking in puddles. And this was not expected. Uh, this was not supposed to be a part of our expedition at all. And uh, it was with great sadness we came down to the coastline. Uh, coastline, as you remember, is again with uh, very much elevated risk of polar bears. But uh, it shouldn't be this. It shouldn't be this melted. This time of year, it shouldn't look like that. This was now in the kind of like middle, late part of May. Uh, it should still be very possible to ski. Uh, at least it was 20 years ago. Uh, but instead, we ended up having beach party. Eric had some whiskey. We finished that. Uh, all of us very happy. Uh, we finished our peanut butters. We finished our coffees. And as you can see, we're literally sitting on a warm, toasty beach. Uh, here, Susanna is taking the first night watch. This here is in the middle of the night because obviously the midnight sun has returned here at the end of May. And with that, uh, we have to be aware. We have to be observant. We have to look around us all minutes every day because the team can't sleep unless someone is awake watching out for the team, especially on the coastline. So here Susanna is doing the night watch, binoculars and rifle, armed and ready. Uh, the coastline also gave us opportunities to film the last interviews of the film in a very different environment. Sunny beach. Who would have thought? We wouldn't have thought. It's just crazy. Uh, we also saw one of the only wildlife we saw in the entire expedition. A seal. I was so happy we didn't see a polar bear, but also so sad that we didn't get to see a polar bear. Because for me personally, that's something I've dreamt of seeing even on this expedition. Um... And then we move out. You can see the, the coastline just behind us here. And 
it is with sadness we're moving out to open water where there should not be any open water. You can see our hair moving out and you, literally we are moving meters from the water. We're, we're still on uh, sea ice here so we're moving on very thick ice, very safe ice. But you know we're wa literally walking through puddles. And here Susanna is uh, removing her skins from her skis for the last time on this expedition. Moments before we got this picture of the team together probably the only picture we have of the whole team other than the starting picture and after that we were rescued by a boat not at all part of our plan and as we got back to Longyearbyen a couple of hours later this is what greeted us where there should have been snow there was mud and water there was it would have been impossible for us to conclude this expedition and not be rescued by a big boat impossible we uh, found out when we reached Longyearbyen that it uh, uh, it had it had warmed up so quickly and the snow had disappeared so quickly that the town was basically full of snowmobile in weird places because people didn't expect the snow to disappear. So the snowmobiles were parked where the snowmobiles were parked, but all of a sudden it's it's asphalt and and mud and uh, gravel and there are snowmobiles littered over the entire village. And then of course we found out the warmest June ever at Svalbard. I just found this online to give an example of that it actually happened. I'm now uh, concerned about the time. I'm going to try to limit myself, but I think I will have another five, ten minutes or so less left of my little speech. And then I hope we can all move into some Q&As. But now we're going to talk about the artistic side of this, the photography. So, as I said, that the... the the Jubilee Expedition has many types of outputs, many types of things that we're putting together. We have a documentary film, we have a podcast series, we will have a speaker series at Pfeiffer Bacon together with the photography exhibition. And we will also uh, be uh, releasing a book. And here is just a little bit of a sample, uh, a moose bush, let's call it, for the up and coming uh, episodes where we'll be talking about uh, printing and preparing an exhibition and I'm also definitely not going to be sharing all the images that I'm going to be sharing at Pfeiffer Bacon because I want to keep some of that secret but I want to share with you some of the, the nuggets some of the interesting little images uh, from this journey and uh, but just to put it into context so this is the exhibition space at Pfeiffer Bacon in Stockholm where we'll be exhibiting this it is an old paint factory. It's beautiful. It has these quirky, amazing facilities or, or, or areas where we will be exhibiting. Uh, here are some of the exhibits they've done over the years in the main room, which is over a thousand square meters big. Like this is a humongous space. And uh, all this space is only for the Jubilee Expedition. So we will be mixing science with, with art, uh, with video, and with audio in this to make it a really living experience. And that's something that I love about working with uh, Pfeiffer Brick and they are really willing to push the boundaries of what is possible. And here's just some of the sketches. So you can see here that we're gonna be printing big, very big. And that's something that really excites me. Uh, we're gonna do some of the prints gonna be uh, normal, like high quality art prints are gonna be up to three meters. Uh, we're gonna have big wraparounds that are even bigger potentially up to 12 meters because uh, we want people to feel we want people to feel the experience of being in Svalbard the entire exhibition is probably going to be in black and white and I say that because I love black and white but I also think it simplifies the landscape it's, it, it peels off all the unnecessary layers it's like an onion you have to remove all the fluff to get to the stuff in the middle and I think with photography this is true so we're going to keep this it's a very simple exhibition. We're going to share the beauty of the, the, the silent, the cold, the eternal landscapes of Svalbard, of the Arctic. And we're going to do so in a way that is very gentle. None of the images are going to be a slap in the face. They're going to be worth exploring, I hope. And they're going to be with a lot of nuance and a lot of subtle details and a lot of negative space. Um, I'm just going to show you 10 or 11 or so examples of images. These images are still in draft format and I'm still editing and I'm test printing. I'm working together with Epson uh, on the printing and I'm going through different papers right now and trying to determine exactly how we want to print this to realize the artistic vision I have for, for these prints. Uh, and as you can see, 
I have on purpose selected images that are calm, that are quiet, that are still. Because that's what I, I want to share from the Arctic. Arctic was supposed to be eternal. It's supposed to live forever. And if you live forever, you don't have time or need to be fast or to be punchy or to be bold. You just exist. And that's, that's really what I want to bring out uh, in this exhibition. These landscapes that are, yeah, for me, they are the dream. They are the, some of the best things you can see on the planet. We're going to include a little bit of life as well, because this, after all, is about the people. Uh, some sections of this exhibition is going to be more about the people and some is going to be more about the, the landscapes. But uh, here, one of my favorite images, actually, from the entire expedition. Um, I'm sure I'll be talking about this image for a while, but uh, when I saw this landscape, when I saw this scene in front of me, and my team was moving away because no one else is interested in the simple lines converging in the space in front of me but me, I, I just stopped, I let them leave. And I was there alone, just photographing, photographing, and then doing my damnedest to catch up because, you know, everyone is still moving. Uh, and again, the team moving, there's going to be some of that in the exhibition. And uh, one of my favorite portraits of Martin, if you can call it a portrait, you can hardly see him, but you can see the landscapes we're in, the vastness of space, of emptiness. There's nothing there. There is nothing there but Martin, sky and snow. For me, this as a photographer, this was uh, these were dream landscapes to photograph. Simple clouds in the sky, blue skies. And as you can see, most of my images are of blue skies because those were the conditions I could photograph in. Because when it's a snowstorm, you don't really want to take the camera out because you don't get much. The simplicities of these landscapes. And here, another one of my favorite images. This one has a lot of editing left for me to do. And this is a first draft of it. The simplicities of these lines is um, for me, I, this landscape was just breathtaking. I'm not sure I've done it justice yet with the capture and the edit, but um, it's all in the printing. The thing about black and white is that black and white on a computer screen doesn't look good. It never has, it never will. Black and white print that looks absolutely fantastic. It needs the structure of paper. It needs the tonality of a medium where you move it, the, shine, the light shines in it, and it, it reflects back on you, and it becomes alive. Printed black and white, whether it's digital uh, via printer or it's at the darkroom, is, for me, the, the ultimate, the ultimate in artistic uh, kind of representation of the world through photography. Uh, it's something that I am incredibly passionate about. And the final image that I'm going to with, share with you today we had this incredible fog just lying above the snow. And we had these clouds and fog from the right and left and above. Incredibly weird day, incredibly weird climate, but so delicate, so beautiful, so ethereal. That's the last image and the last preview for the Jubilee expedition at Five Fabrican. Um, this is the release timeline uh, that we have. So late summer, 2023, so next summer, we're going to start releasing the podcast series and I'm going to be communicating through social media as much as I can and through our partners uh, where you can find us. Uh, in autumn next year, we will release the documentary film and uh, Aoi and Martin has done a phenomenal job filming this incredibly challenging place that we were in under these conditions and with all the limitations you have when you're literally carrying all the equipment that you need and we're going to be talking about that in our next little uh, lecture in a month from now we talk about expedition photography that's the tech side of today you can call it and uh, also in the autumn the photography book will be released and then in january 2024 uh, the photography exhibition and the lecture series will go live at five fabrican for the person who is observant you'll see that these data lines are all 12 months later than they should have been and the reason for this is very simple. I got sick uh, after the expedition and have spent six months uh, recovering and resting. So I have not been able to do my job in the way that I assumed that I would after this expedition. But it's coming. It is coming and it will be great. 
Um, so next lecture in January will be about expedition photography. So we'll be talking about the technical sides of this entire expedition. All that we have uh, basically said today, how did we do it? How did we survive? How did we photograph it? How did we charge our batteries? All these questions and more uh, is about that, like, about to be explained during that session. Uh, and we'll also be looking at the different genres of photography that you have to be doing as well. And it's not just about landscape photography, perhaps. And then in February, uh, creating and printing a photography exhibition. Uh, and there we'll be discussing paper, creative choices, how to build the exhibition and all these things. And uh, with that, I have come to the end. And uh, I'm going to give everyone a minute to start popping in questions for me in the comments field. And I'm going to try to go back to my face only if I am able. There we go. And uh, yeah, uh, if you want to find me on social media, it's Instagram, Jonas Powrell, Vero, the same thing, or Twitter. So Jonas Powrell. And uh, I'm now going to find the, see if we have the live chat here. See if there are any, any questions uh will the technical talk be an image uh sorry will the technical talk be in english from james uh i'm not sure i hope so um i'm as comfortable in english as i am in swedish uh we're going to take stock uh, cyber photo and i together and uh, have a little discussion about which language uh, i'm absolutely fine with that and i hope they will be too because uh, the more the merrier and uh, yeah uh, does anyone else have any? I'm actually seeing now that there is a lag. So maybe that's why there's no questions. Uh, I'm going to give everyone a minute to, in the comment field or in the, in the chat, to send me some questions. All right. We don't seem to have many questions here today. Um, I take that as I have exhausted the topic then. Oh, here we go. I amazing images as always, says Christian Vargas. Looking forward to the podcast and everything else coming up. That is great. Oh, I'm actually getting a question from Cyberphoto. Can you tell us a little sneak peek what is to expect from the podcast? Yes, absolutely. So what I wanted to create with that was something not serious, like serious, but not serious. So we have a photography exhibition, artworks, serious. Uh, we have a lecture series where we're going to talk about topics that are potentially serious because, you know, our world is burning and it's serious. And uh, we have a documentary film that is about adventure, uh, about people, about who we are, about the expedition, about the experience and about the climate. Again, pretty serious, yet adventurous. Uh, we have a photography book, which is more like a diary of suffering. Uh, again, serious. The podcast was supposed to be just like a safe space where the team could talk. So the entire podcast series, I think we have about eight or 10 episodes. I haven't edited them yet, but all of them are recorded from the tent. So we brought an entire podcast studio with us, even though in a micro format on this ex expedition. And we sat in the snowstorms in the tent. You can actually hear the tent flapping a little bit in the background. And that's where we're sharing our thoughts. So interviews with people, con conversations between people. We even have a topic on bodily hygiene during an expedition and that stuff is it's just nasty but it's fun so that's uh, that's what that is about uh, i think i've got some more questions here uh, tom says thanks for a really good talk and fine pictures not a question but i'm grateful to that anyway um, here we go from james what was the biggest challenge in portraying the message from a creative point of view i think that's the biggest challenge i haven't met yet uh, no like it it this was the hardest thing i've ever done in my life uh, being an expedition leader was something this big this move many moving parts like all that is not the creative parts but all that is so complicated it's so big it was so challenging but when i was actually there when i started skiing 
I was exhausted. I should have had a month holiday before the start of this expedition. I was, I was knackered, as they say in England. And with that, I was, um, I can tell you the first week I was unable to create very much. Of course, we had a lot of snowstorms, but I just slept, 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 slept. So for me, the challenge was actually balancing my responsibilities as the expedition leaders and my responsibilities as the photographer or the still photographer on this expedition. And I can tell you those two did not join up seamlessly. I have over 4,000 images, but I think had I not been the expedition leader, had I not had responsibilities for safety and concerns and leading this thing, uh, I would probably have had 8,000 pictures instead, and that would probably have been a better situation. But I'm happy with the result that I have. But uh, for me, the biggest challenge was without a doubt, um, energy-wise, I was spent when I started the expedition. And I was even more spent when I came back home. And uh, definitely the creative uh, photography suffered a little bit from that, uh, especially, I think, uh, taking portraits of people and these things, because that that was uh, harder than taking images of landscape. It always has, at least for me. Um, and conveying the message, if I'm going to try to answer your question literally there, James, that's super hard. How do you show uh, climate change in an image? You can't. But in a series of images, together with spoken word, word, you can convey that message. And I hope that's what I've done today, because that's what I intended to do, to show an adventure. And through that, show that there are people who, like me, are pissed off and wish we would, we'd, we would be doing more. And that believe we can do more, that believe that there are scientists with solutions. And I think when the documentary film comes out, that will become apparent. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that creatively still photography, showing a, a burning forest is very easy, but showing a melting Arctic is very hard in still photography. But a series of images can convey that message, especially when combined with spoken world, word. And that's uh, what conservation photography is all about, I think. Um, I think that's just the last question. I am now almost 15 minutes over time. Uh, I am thankful for your patience tonight guys listening to me i have some technical hiccups this time again i think we overcame them and i hope the audio and the video was good enough i'm super grateful to cyberphoto i'm super grateful to every one of you who came to listen i'm super grateful to all the other sponsors of the jubilee expedition and i hope that all of you who see this will go in and follow the jubilee expedition on instagram on twitter uh, not that we tweet very much but please do it anyway Follow our journey, uh, participate in what we do, come and see our exhibition, uh, join us in these conversations in the speaker series, see the film, you know, learn about what we're doing, learn about the important things that, or at least the things that we think is important. Just join us in that and we'll be super grateful. Uh, great. Uh, get from Cyberphoto, thank you to Jonas, thank you guys, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to part three in January sometime. Don't know when that will be, but it will be exciting. Thank you, everyone, guys. Have a lovely uh, Thursday night, I believe it's Thursday today at least, and uh, enjoy the upcoming uh, soccer, this or football, I should say, I'm Swedish, this coming weekend. Take care, guys. Ciao.